Hello, my name is Shrikant. I am from North Carolina State University. In this presentation, I am going to talk to you about our work, Early Life Cycle Software Defect Prediction. I would like to thank my co-authors, Suvadi and Professor Tim Menzies. For decades, software engineering researchers have been looking at ways to predict quality of the software before it is used. A standard approach in this space is to build models based on large volumes of historical data. For example, in case of a GitHub project, to classify comets in the current release, one would build machine learning models based on all the past comets that are labeled either as defective or clean. Many researchers assume that for software analytics, more data is better. We show in this work, at least for defect prediction, this may not be true. Norvig's claim is supported with numerous examples from vision research. While we agree with the y-axis that solution qual quality could attain a saturation point beyond a certain amount of data, we question the amount on the x-axis. We looked at software engineering literature about sampling policies in defect prediction published in the past decade. We note a remarkably diverse number of sampling policies in the literature that have not been systematically and comparatively evaluated. Not only are researchers hungry for data, but they are also most hungry for the most recent data. We will detail each of these representative sampling policies in the following slides. To assess those sampling policies, we mined numerous popular GitHub projects that are being developed for widely used applications. These projects are non-trivial engineering projects written in widely used programming languages. Those projects are long running and 20% of their comments on average are defective and they churn uh, over 3000 comments. But before we could assess the sampling policies, we wanted to visualize the comments across all the projects we mined, essentially to point to the information rich region. We observed that most of the defects from those projects occur much earlier. So the takeaway from this slide is that be it software engineering or mining for gold, it matters where we investigate. Otherwise, our conclusions could be premising on thin ice. Humans learn from experience and software projects offer experience. Most of the experience occurs early in the project life cycle, yet developers and researchers make a systematic error. They continue to reason across the life cycle or from a shallow end of a recent region, which is a problem since there is relatively less experience. This problem can be avoided by learning from experience-rich regions that offer numerous benefits. This explains why many practitioner beliefs on defect prediction tended to decay as the projects progressed. There are some of the data-hungry defect prediction methods where one builds a machine learning model using all past software comments or from recent three to six months of software comments or just chosen from the recent release. Over the years, we've bold the assumption that if data is useful, then even more data is much more useful. If most of the defects occur very early in the life cycle, then models learned from the first few months of data should perform just as well as any other data-hungry sampling. Using that result, we introduce a new sampling technique called E that samples 50 comets from the first four months of the project lifecycle 
and to avoid class imbalance problems, equal number of clean and defective commits are chosen. We explore two issues for defect prediction. Is more data better? When is more recent data better than older data? In other words, is there one best sampling policy to build defect predictors? To answer the two research questions, this study compares five sampling policies using six classifiers in numerous open source projects. We use seven performance measures to gauge each sampling policy. As mentioned earlier, all our data comes from open source GitHub projects. We used Comet Guru to mine the process metrics and defect information from these projects. But data from Comet Guru does not contain release information, which we extract separately from the project tags using GitHub APIs. To compare sampling policies, we run all pairs experiments in five steps. Each step is a defect prediction model built using one of the six classifiers using data sampled from one of the five uh, policies discussed earlier. Then we use that model to test on all future releases. Then we gauge using six performance me measures and those distributions of those test release scores is uh, analyzed statistically using the Scott Knot test. Whenever a project has a new release, it means that more data, that is comments, is accumulated. Thus, one needs to retrain their machine learning models if they are using data-hungry sampling policies. On the other hand, stop early policy E uses a fixed number of 50 commits that would imply the model need not be retrained, which is a huge benefit that enables practitioners to offer stable conclusions across the software lifecycle. This table shows results of 24 defect prediction models tested in all project releases. No, po no policy and learner pair wins 7 out of 7 times on all performance criteria. But we can say it is useful to apply CFS and logistic regression. To answer this question, is more data better? Are data hungriest sampling policy all that basically uh, ingests all comments from the past loses on most criteria? E that uses 25 defective and 25 uh, clean commits selected at random from the first four months of the project lifecycle is competitive with the rest of the sampling policies. When is more recent data better than older data? This table shows results of 12 defect prediction models tested in all project releases. If recent data is comparatively more informative than older data, then defect predictor predictors built on recent data, that is RR, should outperform predictors built on much older data, that is E. However, we see that E and RR seems to perform almost the same. So uh, we conclude that recency-based methods perform no better than the results from early life cycle predictors. To reiterate, many researchers assume that for software analytics, more data is better. At least for defect predictors, this may not be true. Issues with conclusion instability disappear if early in the life cycle, we can learn a predictive model that is effective for rest of the project. In summary, before assuming complexity, it is prudent to check the raw data looking for shortcuts that can simplify the analysis. We hope these results inspire other researchers to adopt a simplicity-first approach to their work. Thank you for watching my presentation. From uh, North Carolina State. University. Oh, we have a guest.
Hi, Tim. <laughs> for me today. Nice to see you. Oh, I beg your pardon. Federica, how are you? Have you I'm won? Good. I'm good. We have three seconds. We're going to lie. We're going to be live. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Welcome to the session that have a prediction that issues and white classification. Um, we are with the authors of um, the first paper in this session, Every Lifecycle Software Dev Prediction, Why and How. So, Shrink and a uh, team from uh, North Carolina State University are um, two of the authors of uh, the paper and are very happy to take your question. Let me read the first one is from uh, James um, Bolden. So, do you do your conclusion? depend on the time series, looking like the one on your slides, where most development was done early and relatively few commits are currently being made. Yeah, um, it's, yes, pretty much. So, uh, and, and, we're, so and, and we're finding that to be a crazy common pattern. And we can tell you that the paper was that was the paper had uh, popular projects with more than a thousand stars. We've looked at unpopular projects with less than a thousand stars, and it's exactly the same pattern. So we think there's a previously unreported, very general pattern. So, what would be your suggestion to look uh, to build prediction model to look always at the early stages? Sri Yeah, yeah. So. As per these patterns, is early stages, but more generally, what we would like to say is wherever the data is rich, please focus on that. Like, look where your data is rich. The pattern says it's always early because chaos happens in the project often in the early stages and it becomes stable. So, yes. And, and, and I know that people like F Federica have debated different, and myself have debated different sampling policies. If you have multiple releases, do you yeah. train on release? I minus one and test on release I. Based on this paper, we'd have to deprecate that, which is something I've done a lot, by the way. We really, it's, it's like a lot of the stuff based on late life cycle might be completely erroneous where the data is so thin, there's nothing to learn. Yeah, I've seen a few papers coming up in this, uh, with this respect in the last, in the last uh, couple of years. And one would be the, the next paper. Uh, so I think this session uh, uh, can bring to a um, fruitful discussion around the topic. I think we don't still have the right answer, but uh, uh, it, it's good to see the community working towards towards it. Uh, I'll read a couple of more questions. I mean, I have plenty of questions myself, but I guess I have to prioritize others. <laughs> um, well, in the graph, you show that most efforts occur in the first 50 months. How do you justify the first four months threshold? How have you picked yes. the first four months? Simply, we, we, what we did was we tried the various months and we kept shrinking the window until it stopped working. So the moment it became four months and all, all that we needed was four months, that, that uh, was effective for all the state-of-the-art policies that we formed. And uh, I think a follow-up question from Peter is how you have selected uh, the, I mean, why, why 50 data right. points uh, sample over these four months? Why, why just 50? Why not 100? I mean, is 50 enough to train a classifier? That sounds yeah. a bit low. Yeah. So to, to, I, I would like to answer in two ways this question. Sure. Uh, 2008, Dr. Menzi's paper had 50 data points. And uh, recently, in a seminal paper uh, of heterogeneous defect prediction norm and others had 50 data points. And what we did is I started with 600 data points. I reduced it to 300, 150, 50. And uh, less than 50, it stopped working. So I stopped at 50, yeah. where 25 were defective and 25 were defective. Yeah. So this, uh, when you did the, the higher numbers, the results were similar, better. I mean, shall we consider 50 as a low, the results you got with 50 a lower bar? That's, um, that's in the paper. And there's a follow-up paper. Okay. Say, if you email us, we can send you the, yeah. the, the TSC submission we, we put out last Friday, which we're happy to share with everyone yeah. that emails us. And uh, yeah, sure. we're, we're actually doing better in some respects by reasoning only from the early life cycle. Okay. Uh, uh, for like like um, feature selection stuff. We, we can now build a model that's general across, across 250 projects 
using just that early life cycle data. And that works much better than lots of other things. Okay, so we look forward to read more on your uh, TSC extension about this. Um, this question from Shenmyon Chang, uh, why do you think that more data don't improve the prediction performance? What's your insight on, on that, given what you're what, what, Why do you think it does? It, it would. That using I mean, more data no, doesn't no, no, improve. Why, 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 I mean, if there's a signal in the data and the well's shallow, once you get to the bottom of the well, you can keep digging if you want, but there's no more information. You know, what if, so, you know... I think what you're saying is that you find, find this signal at the very early stages. So it doesn't really matter if you add much more data that has been produced later on during the... the early, early in the life cycle, you're yeah. making more mistakes. The ratio of buggy commits to non-buggy commits is highest and most constant. That's an important... Uh, information source. Later on in the yeah. life cycle, you're, you're, you're working with the air is thinner. You're on thin ice, you know, there's, there's less information around. Yeah, I, I can believe this could generalize to, to probably even other uh, open source project. I know you, you mind uh, lots. Uh, Perhaps do, other do domains. Think, yeah, other domains. Do, do you think this could uh, be the case also in industry given your experience with, with software companies, especially for very large projects like uh, uh, at Facebook, at Google, where their software might not be that stable? I mean, time. like, may, may keep growing a lot, but there won't just be a big boom and then. I mean, in my personal experience, uh, when there's a lot of difference between starting something from scratch and a huge feature request. A future request may not, because the, the, the framework is already ready. But when you're starting from a project from scratch, people keep running around in teams and they get, there's a lot of chaos. That's when the most defects probably are uh, injected and most experience is also generated. So, yes. But, 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 what I'd also say to F Federica is, when you mm -hmm. say Facebook, the software is growing, Facebook is not one software. Yeah. Like pe pe people work on separate projects. So what I'd yes. like to know is whether our profile, that there's more information gain, more information acquirable early life cycle, where that occurs in-house. In I think that's a very reasonable question. Yeah. That, that, You're a very reasonable woman. <laughs> OK, uh, I think there are no other questions from the audience. We still have a few uh, minutes. May I ask a more uh, technical question? Because I, I read the paper, I got pretty uh, um, curious given uh, we, we shared this uh, this question for the prediction. So um, I haven't let, quite understood the old policy. Yeah. Let's, let, let, let's ask ah, okay. the cross-project question. Yeah, OK. Have you tested on cross-project? Yes, Sri Khan, can you tell us, <laughs> tell us about the last two weeks of your life writing that TSC paper? <laughs> yeah, a lot of overleaf errors and lot of errors. Yes, we we've, we've tested it on cross project, and uh, that results holds surprisingly even there. Uh, even the same fifty data points suffices, and uh, in fact, we have uh, even more uh, improvements over that. Uh, we we've, we've introduced a policy called E plus that only looks at two features instead of fourteen features, and surprisingly, it, it suffices. Well, but it's not just the features. It's because I don't want to go back to the Martin Shepard days of lines of code as a surrogate for everything else. It's two features collected early in the life cycle. Okay. So, so we, we, there's been a lot of prior talk about what features matter the most. And, I, and I'm going, well, that's a context-independent statement. Why don't you ask what features matter the most at the time when they're most collected? You know, so, so um, okay. I, yeah. But the cross-project stuff, we've benchmarked it against TCA+, a whole bunch of other cross-project methods, and we really are saying that learn from the first 150, you can build a model that works across 250 projects. Yes. Okay. Would you reveal us without these two features? So we have to read the TSC paper. <laughs> Srikant? Uh, sorry? The, you... They're, 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 they're two size-based measures, right? We have yeah, two size-based measures. Yes, yes. Uh,